Hi, I'm Paul Tremaine, and welcome to another session of Smart Boating. As you know, if you watched the show before, we cover a wide variety of topics, from insurance to man overboard. And the general idea is to provide you with some information that will help you make smarter decisions and have more fun on the water. And today's show is right up that alley, and we're going to look at the subject of spring commissioning. And joining us is a very experienced boater, his name is Edward Cushing. Welcome, Edward. Hi, Paul. Thanks so much for having me on your show once again. Yeah, great to see you. Hey, we've got a, a really timely show, a really very interesting show on spring commissioning. But before we get into that, can you share a little bit about your experience with boats and any experience you might have with spring commissioning? Well, I have a lot of experience in both boats and spring commissioning. Okay. And uh, essentially, uh, I've hung around boats most of my my in adult life yeah. and and before when I didn't know any better. Yeah, sure. So from childhood on up, huh? right? It's yep. been uh, it's been a great adventure and it continues. Yes, yes. And uh, spring commissioning is the hardest, but the most uh, incentive raising time for getting ready to actually enjoy your boat for the rest of the we hope warmer season the warmer season yeah, that's how the whole thing gets started right, right. The, kind of the ritual begins with spring commissioning right, right. yeah exactly and you've probably done that a number of times over well, the years yeah, i've done it with a number of different size boats from nine feet up to 53 feet and a few things in between and it's uh it's uh it's an adventure every every time it is an adventure. there's always a new twist that i don't anticipate yes yeah that's a good point <laughs> Well, you and I both have some experience in this area, so maybe we can share it in our show today. Absolutely. All right. Look so, forward to it. All right. Well, let's get going then. Well, Edward, this topic of spring commissioning is a large one, like a lot of the topics that we handle here, and we can't do a complete justice in a half hour, but I think we can cover the highlights. And uh, I want to mention that neither you and I are really considered an expert, but we are very experienced practitioners. We've done this a number of times, right? Absolutely. So we've got some good points to share. Now, this is my boat, and it's a fiberglass boat. And when I take the cover off, the winter cover, start the spring commissioning process, I want to get it as clean as possible. So what I do is I use a household cleanser, which is a little aggressive, called West Oil. I put that on first because I find it really cuts grease and grime and nicks and that sort of thing. So I put that on to basically almost strip the old wax off is what I'm doing. And then I'll follow it with a cleaner wax. I'm gonna take this, that. Yeah, and this is a, a 50 cleaner wax. So yeah. whatever the less oil didn't pick up, I, I pick up with this cleaner wax. And then finally, I put a coat or two of the, uh, the regular pure wax on it. Uh, how about you? What, what's your process? Well, I sort of uh, skip, well, in the fall I clean the boat really well before I cover it mm -hmm. so that come springtime, really all I do is give it a, a good uh, hard rinse oh, with either okay. a, a, a mechanical power washer yeah. or a good strong hose. Yeah. And that'll at least lift off everything. And then I use a, a, a combination of a a polish, polishing, uh, or what they call a sort of a, what's the word I want? It's a polishing wax. Okay. So it's kind of a, a cleaner and then a, a wax simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So I only do it once. Okay. And uh, that seems to work. And then if I find out if I have any flat spots, I'll go back and repolish it with either a real, a final wax yeah, or sure wax, just yeah. the cleaner wax once again. I see. Okay. And that uh, works pretty well. Yeah, I'm yeah. pleased with it. Good, good. Well, Edward, uh, one of the other early steps in the spring commissioning process for me is uh, I examine the hull and I uh, sand the rough spots and then I apply some bottom paint. Now, I've moved to a water based paint. They've just come out with these in the last couple of years. They're uh, easier to clean up. Uh, if you get them copper free, they're easier on the environment and uh, good multi-use, multi-season and uh, I can use it on the out drive because it has no copper in it. But uh, so when people use a paint like this, a water-based paint, they got to remember like a four to six inch roller is pretty good and then use a very short nap, three sixteenths or less because it's, really? it's a different type of paint. How, how do you handle that part of your boat? Well, I have to admit I haven't done much bottom painting of late but uh, I've been just contemplating that with this new boat that I bought because mm -hmm. 
I want to be sure I got the right thing on there. But this is yeah. very interesting, and I, I would certainly look at that as the next time I go to paint the bottom. Yeah, uh, this is key. This is this is the way the paints are going, and right. you get the right roller and apply it the right way. Yeah, that's, that's something great. people need and to kind of. And it's got directions right on the can on what size nap to use. Yes. Yes, it's a big help. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Edward, you know, another job that boaters have to do when they're outside the boat working on the hull is pay attention to the zincs. And you've got a couple of zincs there. It looks like a, a block zinc that attaches to the hull and one that goes around the, the propeller shaft and the gear case. They look kind of corroded. Yeah, they do, but, you know, that's what they're supposed to do. They're the yeah. self-sacrificing part of your electrolysis issues. Yes, yes. So the fact that they are corroded, that's a good sign, right? Absolutely. That means they're if doing they their weren't, thing. then we'd, I want to know what was corroded. That was bad news, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you check the zincs, and then we've got a propeller here, and uh, this is a nice stainless steel prop. Oh, it's beautiful. And uh, this off-season, I had a new splines put into them. You can see it right there. It's a bronze spline, and it was funny because when I was talking to the guy, he says, well, you know, you had the wrong splines in it. The splines in it were designed for fresh water, that would have caused failure. I didn't realize that ever since I bought the boat. He says, we'll put bronze splines in there so it'll be good for the corrosion, anti-corrosion in the salt water. Uh -huh. So that was an important thing to discover. And the other thing I discovered is that these splines, this bronze insert, is a little longer than the one that came out. And what happens is that uh, when you mount this on the drive, let's say the drive is over here and this is the prop shaft, it slides down those splines and then uh, it's supposed to bottom out on the edge of the splines. Right. But there was a spacer in there. Volvo has something they call a line cutter that protects the bushing bearing back there. And that's a fixed length. And what I found was when I put this on very shortly before putting the boat in the water, they didn't fit. Yeah. They didn't fit. So uh -huh. I go, oh my God, how can that be true? I got this really fixed up prop and I've got the, the spacer that are fixed. Mm -hmm. But it, well, it didn't fit, and I kind of went back and forth. Should I fix it, or is it really need fixing, or whatever? But finally, I thought, well, let's go on the path of safety, make sure the prop seats properly. So I had to actually make some adjustments on the space that was in there. But my point is that oftentimes when you get work done, sometimes it doesn't meet up exactly to the stuff that's in the boat. And so mm -hmm. you have to give yourself a little time to get that process done, right? Right. Yeah. You do. I mean... This is the preparation prior to launch is really critical and cutting any corners is going to really come back and bite you right. when you least expect it. It can be a safety issue. So if you feel can uncomfortable be. with some new pieces, um, mm -hmm. revisit them and make sure that they fit the way you know they should, right? Right. Well, Edward, you know in the old days the boats were made of wood so there was lots of wood treatment, whether it was mm -hmm. mahogany, teak, whatever. It's not so much anymore, but there's still a lot of teak accents which you have to take care of. And what I've noticed that if people don't take care of it after a couple of years, it's really difficult to bring back. So what I do is I use the two, two things, a, a teak stripper, if you will, or a cleaner. I scrub it, got to wash it right off, otherwise it strips all the wax going down the hull. And then I use a, teak, a, couple, a couple applications of the teak oil, and that really keeps the wood at the right place. What, what approach have you used? Well, I found that uh, I've tried to sidestep as much scrubbing as possible. Okay, all right. And uh, I bought an electric power washer a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. and I find that in, uh, in about a quarter of the time, it's twice as effective as a deep cleaning with some wear and tear on the teak itself. But then once you've power washed it, let it dry, and then you yep. apply the oil, and it looks, oil. it looks brandy spank new. Wow, that's a nice shortcut. Yeah, <laughs> it works great. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Edward, once I start working the interior of the boat, I typically work from the bow to the stern, help me so I don't forget things. And one of the things I do is this instrument panel has all the connections behind it, and there's an access door behind it in the, in the cabin. I'll open that up and uh, check to see if there's any debris back there. One spring, I found the mice had created a ball of uh, paper towels in there for a nest. It's sitting right on the top of the electrical panel. So, Jesus, I'm glad I found that. That could have been a fire in the making. So it's good to check the connections if you can. And then I, I like to spray them with a cleaner protector, keep things clean and dry. Do you do anything in that area? 
Um, well, I, I just sort of open up the back and take a look at the in the interior and I do a visual, but I a don't visual. spray anything. Right, back right. There. You're, they're clean and usually dry they, are they are clean. Although now I'm dealing with a more of an outdoor boat, yeah. so I'm maybe you'll learning, get into this. Maybe sort of, I'll try uh, some of that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, Edward, another key maintenance item in spring commissioning is through hulls, and just to describe what that is, a through hull actually. Let's say this was the hull. The through hull goes through the hull like that, and then uh, you tighten it down here so it stays in one place. And then you attach this uh, this valve mechanism here, like that. So these are down in the bottom of the boat, in the bilge and that sort of thing. And they allow water to either pass or not pass based on this valve. You close and open this valve. And what I found is that I like to exercise that valve during the spring commissioning. Is that an important thing to do? Absolutely. Uh, with salt water especially, you get corrosion. And it, because the valve is used so infrequently, mm -hmm. it basically just sort of gets comfortable being closed or open. And right. if you don't exercise it and move it around, it will stick someday and not be in the place you want to have it. It could freeze. And what happens here is we've got a, usually a hose coming off here. So if this through hole is open and can't close and that hose breaks, that boat is basically going to sink, for lack right. of a better way to put it, right? So right. really important thing that you don't normally think of, but check your boat for this sort of thing through hulls and make sure you give exercise to these valves, right? Make sure the valve, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, Edward, on my boat, um, I carry close to 100 gallons of gas. And that's basically uh, like a big bomb. <laughs> it so, is. You, so you want to be very careful about that. And what I do as part of my commissioning is there's access hatches, large ones and small ones. You've got one in your hand here. They pull up from the floor and they allow you to see down into the tank and visually inspect it. So I get a flashlight out like this. I climb up and around things and I put my head in there and I look around, I feel around because I'm, I'm trying to monitor for corrosion and rust. I think that's probably a good thing to do for most people to do. Do you, uh, do you take care in that, that part <clears throat> of the operation as well? Well, conveniently in my, in my new uh boat I have an engine cover on hydraulic struts that picks up it shows me the gas distribution system mm -hmm. I can see the bilge all around and then I have two the little inspection ports yeah. for the tanks themselves okay so I have a, a pretty good sense because every time I use the boat I open up the hatch cover and do right. a visual right right everything. that's in the season but you do time. a pre-launch oh, check over part of your commissioning Make process. Make sure all the, all the hose clamps are tight yeah. and um, nothing is dripping in Nothing's the wrong out of place. order, right. Very important. Edward, in the spring commissioning process, I, I pay a particular attention to some areas that might traditionally be overlooked. One of them was the bilge. And this boat, the water comes in, it hits the, the deck, and then it runs back here past the batteries. So one of the things I do is I make really sure that that access is free, the water can flow freely, and go down to the bilge where it's supposed to be, and then it gets pumped out. So I, I make sure all the passages are clear. And then I check around these pumps. I've got one of these little self-sensing pumps right at the base of the transom. Beautiful. It does a great job of pumping the water out every 60 seconds. But it's pretty small, and it's got some small uh, entrance vents here. And I'm always concerned about sludge, because that's where all the stuff in the boat builds will come back to, the base of the transom. Sure. I'm worried about having a good battery, good wiring, good pump, but it being clogged up. So I pay particular attention to getting all that sludge and all that material out of there. How about you? Oh, absolutely. I sort of, since I pretty much pump the boat every time I use it, just because there's always something in the bilge. Mm. Um, I just do a visual on it and then I'll reach in and clean out whatever seems to have been accumulated. An, an older boat always seems to grow an interior rug that you need to continually Yeah. yeah. So you take care bleed. of that during the spring commission. You take a focus oh, yeah, on absolutely. that. Absolutely. Make sure this area is clear. The, the bilge has a nice drain hole in the middle of the bottom so I can rinse everything out of it at that point. Yep. Keep it clean. Don't let debris get around your bilge. Right. Pump. Yep. Edward, you know, batteries are a key component of any boat, whether it's a <laughs> power boat or a sailboat. This boat carries a couple batteries, and it was interesting, as part of my spring commissioning, I charge them with a charge of this charger right here. Sure. And, and what happens is they start at like a five 
amps, I guess, and they, they went down to about two and a half, which is the normal behavior. So I said, well, I'm all set. And then when I went a week or two later, turned the key, I found that number one battery wasn't reacting. So what I did was I borrowed this load tester here and I put a load, it's a big resistor. You put it across the barrier like this and you, you hit the switch. So right now it's reading, I don't know, about 11 volts. You know, that's pretty good. But when we put a load on it, it goes right to zero. So isn't that interesting where the battery looks and acts good, but until there's a load on it, you wouldn't be able to tell. So it's kind of important to somehow put a load on your batteries before you really need them, right? Right. Well, the other thing you want to be sure is you have them date stamped because yes. marine batteries have a shorter shelf life, three to four, three years, four years, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you need to know at the end of three, no matter what the battery is telling you, it's really on the edge of tipping over. Right. So whether it's your professional that's checking or you, make sure you somehow kind of simulate real world conditions and see if the battery's really up to snuff, right? Right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, Edward, as you know from your experience, marine engines need cooling water. And uh, so it's a series of uh, hoses and different fittings, different components. One of the things I do that people might consider in the spring commissioning is check for places where the water comes in and then it slows down. For example, in this boat, there's an oil cooler with a screen on it. And what I find consistently is that mussels get caught in there and they grow and over the period of a season. By the time you get to the end of a season, it's just a whole cluster of mussels in there that really impair the cooling system. So I take off the hose and then I, I clean out the mussels there. So I think that's a good thing for people to think about, points like that where it could get, could get uh, hindered, if you will, right? So now you're in the aquaculture business, huh? Yeah, that's right, right, I can sell those mussels. I get quite a few every year. <laughs> so I do that, and I think that's a good idea, and then, uh, water pumps, they, uh, they're a critical component, right? They're gonna, they're gonna suck in the water and push it around the cooling system and push it out. And the, the key part of the, uh, is the impellers. So they look like little, little cans with a little fan blades coming off them. Sure. And they rotate in there in the water pump. And what happens is if you get near sandy water or sandy bottom or uh, over age, they'll tend to fatigue. So you want to keep an eye on that and think about replacing it every now and then. Mm -hmm. Now the mistake I made is that I brought my spare impellers down to the marina to get order the new one. And they said, well, which one do you want? <clears throat> well, I didn't realize at the time I gave them the impellers that they were two different impellers. So <laughs> I had to come back to the boat and actually take out the regular impeller and bring it down there and refitted it. But my point is that <clears throat> things change on a boat. So the point is here, the water pump was changed at one time. So I had an, an impeller for that and I had an impeller for the current one. And that could get very confusing at a time when I might really need to put a new impeller in there. So my recommendation is when you look at these sort of things, make sure you get clear on what's actually in the boat, what you need to keep on board as spares and what not. Well, by whatever one you do install, it comes in a box with a number on it. Yes. You should either save the box, you can compress it and put it yeah. into a folder. Yeah. And then you've got the serial number, so when you go to get the next one, you just have the serial number right at hand. Get the right one. And, and again, you keep the right spare on board in case yeah, you need it. Exactly. Now you've got a hose in your hand. Uh, you've got a boat recently. Did you, uh, did you look over the hoses on that on your spring commissioning? Oh yes. Well, I was going to say... Let's get it up here so that people can see We're talking it. about inboard engines as opposed to outboards, but uh, hoses, especially in a marine environment, as they sit and don't uh, get activated all winter so they can dry out yeah. get brittle and crack and, right? and crack and yeah. I I ran the motor for a, a couple of hours and then I started inspecting it and there was a nice little seam breaking out in the back and it was just drip drip dripping so yeah. I was able to catch it and but on most marine inboards you, you double clamp your hoses yeah. small ones or big ones anything to do with going in or out of the ocean right. you want to double clamp them for your own peace of mind because yeah. one clamp could let go and your boat you might find on the bottom of the bay the next day right so check them over in the spring commissioning process exactly. right well, Edward when I get into the mechanicals of spring commissioning 
I really like to have a factory manual basically like this to tell me my tolerances and the correct filters and plugs and that sort of thing. Um, for example, the, I, I use to set the plugs, I use the dimensions shown in the, in the factory manual. So it becomes very, very helpful there. I change the plugs every year. Might be overkill, but I've got an older engine and I like that extra margin of safety. And uh, I'll change the filters, right? This is the, uh, this is the rate gore. So there's a double filtration system here. Do you have a similar uh, setup on your boat? I do, actually. I'm just sort of learning about it because this is sort of a, a new boat to me. Mm -hmm. So I have to sort of, you know, on, on diesel they do uh, sort of a similar thing with a glass bowl on the bottom so you can see if there's any water gathering. Yes, and yes. And many boats now they do a double system on bigger diesel engines. Right. But on gas, a single one is... Right, pretty, like you have on your sufficient. smaller boat. So this is a spin-on right. filter that you got there. This is a spin-on oil filter, which is very convenient. A fuel filter, yep, to fit for the gas. Oh. So this is all part of the gas system right here. So, um, yep, that's going to trap the water and trap the particles. Right. And this is this Raycor actually sits upstream of that. So the gas comes from the gas tank through the Raycor over to the spin-on gas filter and then up into the engine. Oh, so, okay. So if there's water here or sediment, this is going to trap it. It's key to get those changed as part of your spring commissioning, right? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And getting water in the fuel, bad things happen. <laughs> well, the <laughs> engine stops. <laughs> That's right. Well, Edward, another, what I feel is an important part of the spring commissioning process is taking care of the power plant and the associated uh, components, especially from a, a finish standpoint. So what I do every year is I'll uh, look for uh, points where the paint might have peeled up and a little rust is starting. Clean it off, prime it, and then uh, you can get the, this is a Chevy, so you can get the Chevy paint at your local Napa store. And that's uh, uh, manifold paint, right? Right. Yep, so high temperature. Mm -hmm. And again, same thing. Uh, I think that if you catch the rust early on, that's a good way to do it, right? Absolutely. Yep, and this is a, uh, a rust treatment. You can get this at most auto parts stores. Sometimes in the build you get places where water drips on things. For example, like a trim pump or something like that. They're made out of metal and they rust pretty quickly. So what I find is that if I clean them off and then I put some of this rust treatment on it, it arrests the rust at that point and it makes for a really effective way to keep that component maintained. That sounds like a good plan. I Every fall I would give the engine a good rinse off with water first mm -hmm. so that when the season begins and you're doing your painting you don't you don't, you don't have a rust being generated all winter yes yes that's a good point yeah so maybe get a hop on in the fall even before the spring commissioning right, right? yeah good idea well, Edward you know when people think about spring commissioning oftentimes they think about washing waxing bottom paint uh, that sort of thing but I think another critical component is some of the gear that you keep on board, particularly the safety gear. And the first thing I think of is uh, fire extinguishers. They have expiration, they have life and expiration dates, and they have that needle, right? It goes red to green. So part of a spring commissioning process should be checking those fire extinguishers to make sure they're solidly in the green, right? Absolutely. The, you know, yes, you need your fire extinguishers, the ones in the engine compartment and then the ones uh, that are readily accessible. Yeah, yeah, so that's important. And then we're wearing some PFDs. These are inflatables. Uh, you just bought some recently, right? Right, well they have in various versions. This is the more the offshore version. Mm -hmm. But the newer, the new ones for inshore are just, it's like putting on a, a, a vest. It's very lightweight. Yeah. And uh, they, um, all the safety people are saying you should be wearing one at all times right. now because especially <clears throat> this time of year, you need it because of the water temperature. You don't have any real uh, hypothermia really can get to you quick. It's gonna be bad news, yeah. And again, in terms of the spring commissioning, they have these windows which uh, change from <clears throat> green to red. So, so as you're going through your gear, you should be looking at the window to make sure they're solidly in the green so you know that they're going to be good for the season. Right. right. And then the, the, another piece of equipment that strikes me is the, 
This is the flare kit for the boat. And uh, again, uh, I've got a flare gun and I've got various types of indicators in here. Of course, one of the big, big items, of course, is the flares themselves, particularly the handhelds that people like to use. And these, again, have expiration dates on them, right? They do, yes. Yeah, so part of the spring commissioning is you'd want to look them over and read the dates to make sure, even though they look good, they might have been in the package for the last three years, you want to make sure that they're current, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, Edward, it's hard to believe, but it's time to wrap up the show today. And, and we've really covered a lot of ground in terms of spring commissioning. You know, uh, from preparing the hull and preparing the engine and preparing some of the gasoline and the ignition systems. There's a lot to do that either you do or a professional does. And, um, you know, I, it's, it's, I think it's a tremendously good idea because with your boat in tip-top shape, you're going to have a fun, trouble-free season, relatively so, right? Exactly. And uh, oftentimes people use a checklist, which is a professional doing it or you're doing it, use a checklist to make sure you hit the important items. That's always a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, anything else comes to your mind? Well, no, I think that uh, you've really covered a lot of territory today. It's a lot of boat to, to worry about. <laughs> right. But it's, you know, the checklist helps you work through all of that. Yeah. Yeah, and you've got some teak oil in your hand there, I see. Yeah, and whenever I put on the teak oil, I know the boat launching isn't far away. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And thank you, smart boating viewers, for watching. If you've got comments or questions, please visit us at our website, www.smartboatingus.com. Thank you.